today. My name is Jeremy uh, from here at Flying Me Out of World headquarters. And today we're going to talk a little bit about torque and horsepower in general terms and also in how it relates to the Miata with some specific examples, uh, just to give a little bit of an education in case anybody has any questions about, you know, what are some fundamental differences between these, you know, units of measure that you hear about torque and horsepower. So, you know, as always, if you have any questions during the video, please leave them in the comments. Uh, we try to catch some of them live and anything we don't catch live, we'll catch in the comments later on after we get this all posted. And then also, if you like, uh, enjoy what we're doing here, please remember to like and subscribe, hit those buttons. Uh, and that way that'll help to keep us doing this on a regular basis. So uh, if all goes well, we have a new video every week. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so what is torque and what is horsepower and how do they relate? So anytime, you see the power output measurement from an engine. You know, you can see it in a couple different ways. You can see, you know, from the manufacturers are generally gonna record that on an engine dyno where they have just the engine strapped up to the measurement device. Uh, in the aftermarket, we generally set that up on a chassis dyno where we have the whole car strapped to a device. And, you know, the, <clears throat> some, an important thing to keep in mind there is when you're on a chassis dyno, which pretty much everyone in the aftermarket uses, uh, you're going to see some, some power loss through the drive line. So, you know, those numbers aren't going to exactly match up to what the, the OEs report, uh, you know, for the official power numbers for an engine because they're probably using an engine dyno. So something to, to keep in mind there is the relationship. But on each one of those graphs, you're going to see measurements of torque and horsepower. And so what is the difference? I mean, what the dynamometer is actually measuring is torque and you know torque is kind of a measurement of rotational force and it's you know the wheels or the engine the flywheel whatever it's rotating and it's it's putting force against some sort of a restriction whether that be a weighted unit uh, you know however they decide to, to load that down <clears throat> and then the way horsepower is is horsepower is actually a, actually a calculation where is if you take torque multiplied by your RPM and then take that sum and divide it by 5252. And that gives you a horsepower output. So really torque is what's being measured and horsepower is being calculated from that measurement. So, you know, when you're doing a run, that's why they also need to have an RPM pickup so they know what the RPM is so that they can do that measurement and give you your torque and horsepower. And because of that equation, uh, you will always notice that on every dyno chart, the torque and the horsepower lines cross at 52, 52 RPM, and that's because of that formula. And I've got a bunch of dyno charts up here we'll take a look at later, but you'll see that's true in every one of them. It's gonna be true with every car that you see. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, why would you wanna pay attention to one versus another? And, you know, torque kind of is helping to determine the acceleration of the vehicle. And this is kind of <clears throat> overly simplified, but, you know, horsepower is, is kind of, going to give you an indication of its ability to, you know, sustain the work. If, I don't know if that makes sense. Some of these explanations will hopefully <clears throat> be able to clarify that. And you want to look at it in the relationship of what is a, you know, what are you trying to accomplish and how would you want to set up a car or make modifications or decide on a direction you want to go based on what it is you're trying to accomplish and not just looking at peak numbers on a chart. Of course, you know, everyone online, they want to always brag about peak numbers on a chart, but the peak numbers are just that. They, they tell part of the story, but they don't tell the whole story. So it's important to understand a little bit more to kind of get a, a better idea of the whole story. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what, for example, what is, what is torque good at? You know, torque is going to be good at, for example, accelerating out of low speed corners. You know, if you're in a really tight, twisty autocross course or a short track, uh, you know, your torque is gonna help you to accelerate quickly out of those corners. Whereas, um, you know, the RPM is going to be more purposeful for helping you to maintain high speeds. So, <clears throat> for example, say you have, you know, a, a, a diesel pickup truck with 700 foot pounds of torque it can accelerate quickly from a low speed. It can do a tremendous amount of work from a low speed, but it doesn't have a lot of high end RPM because it doesn't carry much RPM. And so it's not able to, to maintain those higher speeds. Or for example, say you're on a racetrack that has really, really long straightaways, your horsepower is gonna help you to, main, to, to achieve and maintain that high speed 
but through the use of the RPM to keep you going down those long straightaways. Um, and the torque's not really so important. So for example, you know, on the other side of having a big diesel pickup, say you have, you know, a Honda S2000 that has lots of RPM and lots of top end horsepower, but all the torque of a number two pencil rolling off a school desk. Um, you know, so an R S2000 is gonna do much better on the straightaways on a long track than a truck and vice versa coming out of that tight corner leading onto the track, that high torque is gonna help you to move out of that tight corner where the S2000 is, you know, gonna feel like your grandma on your walker could possibly catch you to the first cone. Um, <clears throat> so when you're looking at these aspects, in an ideal world, you wanna to try to balance what those areas you look like in terms of the usability for what you want your application to look like. So, uh, you know, of course in the Miata, we're, we've got one six, one eight, two liter engines. Um, and we only have so much displacement to work with. So, you know, also we'll talk a little bit about forced induction and how that can help, you know, what, what a real world trade off is for that, some of that stuff. I'm kind of rambling. So let me kind of try to stay a little bit more on track. Um, <clears throat> so let's go over and take a look at some dyno charts here to try to put the theory into a little bit more context. Um, this kind of dovetails into, you know, what kind of displacement versus induction. You know, if, if, if you have all of the options in the world for displacement, um, going higher in displacement is going to increase your torque. With, with our cars that we love, the displacement is what it is unless we wanna do uh, an LS conversion. So we can augment that with forced induction. And it's gonna look like different things in different setups. Um, for example, so we've got a bunch of charts up here. Let's start out with, so here is an ND. Uh, down here on this black, set up, you can see this is the output from a stock, uh, is that ND, Andy? Yeah, 2017. So stock ND, uh, when we had it set up on our dyno, you know, people always talk about, oh, what's the horsepower? Well, the horsepower on this was in about 128 horse and about 128 foot pounds of torque, you know, pretty square, which is nice. But again, that's just the peak number. Um, the area under the curve is really the important part. And more importantly than that, the area under your general usable RPM range is the most important part. So in this particular case, when we put our stage one turbo on it, you can see that it bumped it up to about 206 horse and you know, also actually about 206 foot pounds of torque. So again, pretty square numbers. You can see that it elevated the torque and the horsepower 100% across the range, you know, even all the way down to you know, about 2000 RPM. So there is no point ever where it's making less power than it did stock and it's just making more over here. So in this situation, by adding the turbocharger to this car, you're gonna get more low end torque by which you're gonna be able to you know, accelerate and get out of the turns. Really the low end torque is gonna to be more beneficial for your street driving for the most part. And you're gonna get a lot more top end RPM. So you're gonna be able to, to achieve and maintain higher top speeds on those long straights, you know, should you have enough room in front of you to get to those places. So it's really kind of a win across the board. Um, Here's another example with a NA car. You know, this is our 1995 car um, and up stock, you know, here at our elevation, it was putting down a whopping about 82 horsepower uncorrected here at our, at our dyno. And then when we put on our stage one turbo kit, it bumped it up to about 173. And so once again, adding the turbo to this really improved your torque and your horsepower across the board at all RPM. So it's a phenomenal functional improvement. Um, <clears throat> And similarly, a supercharger will do the similar kind of thing depending on the supercharger. Uh, we've got some examples over here from an NC. You can see the green lines down here on bottom were when the car was stock. It's about 148 horse, 135 torque uh, at the wheels here. And then this is showing the benefits of a couple different kinds of supercharger kits. That, and this is something that we did a number of years ago. A long time ago, we had a, a, the, the Magnuson MP62-based supercharger kit that we sold for these cars. And you can see in the green line here, this was a pretty much a, just a direct upage of the power and torque. Those constant displacement superchargers give you a really flat, even torque curve across 
um, you know, a little bit extra at the very bottom end in exchange for a little bit less on the very top end. Um, in comparison to, in this case, uh, we had a Rotrex supercharger uh, at <clears throat> a couple different boost levels, essentially. And so you can see that not all superchargers created the same. These Rotrex superchargers behave a lot more like a turbocharger where they do give you some extra bottom end across the board, but it's, it's not much. And then they really start to flow more highly on the top end. So, you know, the Rotrex superchargers kind of have a similar horsepower feel to what a turbocharger might have, depending on the sizing of the turbocharger and, of course, the sizing of the super. So um, there's different ways to get to what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then, of course, down here on the end, we have something like this particular NA that we did an LS3 conversion on. Looks like this one was a cammed LS3. Started out about 100 horse and 103 foot-pounds of torque way down here. And then we dropped in a cammed LS3 and bumped it up to about 440 and 417. And as you can see, um, there's a slight improvement in torque all the way across the RPM range. Uh, but, you know, you may not want to give up that extra 1,000 RPM to get it. I don't know. That's your call. Um, and what this is really showing you is that, you know, they say there's no displacement for displacement. And this is why. Uh, displacement is going to just increase everything across the board all the time. Whereas when you're dealing with forced induction, you can use the forced induction to get always more top end power and usually more bottom end torque with some caveats, uh, but it's, it's not going to give you the same bottom end as increasing in displacement. So for example, when we would go to the two liter stroker, you know, that two liter stroker engine give us a little bit more displacement, put a turbo on that and you'd have, you know, a little bit more bottom end as well. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. So why might you want to pay attention to some of this stuff? How you set up the induction and the power band of your car is going to have a lot to do with your enjoyment and you know, how happy you're going to be with the driving experience. Are you the kind of drive, and, and, and try to really think about how you actually use the car, not how um, you, know, you think you use the car, if that makes sense, because a lot of people have kind of preconceived notions about how they think they use the car, but then really they go to the track once or twice a year, but they drive every day. So, you know, deciding on what those accommodations and trade-off looks like will have a lot to do with your happiness every time you get in the car versus maybe just a couple times a year. So generally speaking, you want to try to tend towards maximizing the area under your curve for torque and horsepower in your usable range of where you're normally gonna be driving the car. So for your street car, most people spend most of their time probably between, you know, two and 5,000 RPM with maybe some jaunts out to redline every once in a while. So, you know, in that case, a setup like, you know, one of our, our stage one turbo kits that also is giving what you can do with the displacement you have is really trying to fill in that, that bottom end is gonna make it a much more drivable car. Same on the stage one turbo kit over here for the NA. You know, if this is legitimately a track car and you wanna really try to optimize a more narrow power band, say between, you know, four and 7,000 RPM, then you've got some different choices. You know, the top end horsepower becomes a little more important in that trade off between horsepower and torque. Uh, when you're talking about a car where you're actually spending a significant amount of time up above, you know, 5,000 RPM, that's really pragmatically just not what you're doing in a street car. And in that case, you might want to look at turbo sizing. Like, for example, here's this dyno chart over here. This is one of our old stroker cars. Um, and as you can see here, this was a car with a very large turbo. And so you see what looks like a tremendous amount of lag to get up to this, you know, 434 horse uh, area that this one was putting out on E85. Um, and with this particular example, you know, if, if this is legitimately a car that's spending time between five and 7,000 RPM, then this is absolutely where you want to be. But if this car is spending a lot of time between, you know, two and 5,000 RPM, you know, you're, you're going to find yourself maybe wishing you had something that was a little bit more responsive in terms of the happiness that you have when you drive the car every day. So, being aware of how those things relate to each other is really important and being honest with yourself about what it is you're trying to get out of the enjoyment every time you get in the driver's seat. And one of the things we want to help you with is to have the most fun that we can, that you can 
in the driver's seat. You know, it's one of our main goals. So, you know, when you call us, talk to our tech support guys, which are awesome, you know, be realistic with them about what you're really trying to accomplish so that they can try to give you the best advice to, to help you reach your goals. So <clears throat> in summary, Torque and horsepower are related, but you want to think of them in different ways depending on the purpose and don't ignore one for the sake of the other. Um, you, you don't wanna just look at peak numbers because peak numbers only tell you part of the story. You wanna look at that actual area under the curve, you know, how much space is on the chart in the areas, the RPMs that you're actually driving. So when you're looking at, should I do the high compression build, naturally aspirated build, supercharged build, um, turbo build, you know, what is gonna get me in that space? Uh, and that's, you know, primarily why, you know, we tend to prefer turbos is because in that normal driving range of, you know, a performance street car, you know, the turbos, if you size them correctly, will slot a significant power, uh, horsepower and torque improvement within those RPM ranges and really maximize that area under the curve. Um, you know, the most enjoyment for the least amount of, of you know, effort really is what it is. So um, let's see if I missed anything here. And again, you know, what makes it most fun to drive is really in the eye of the beholder. So it's trying to help get you as much information and our customer service team relay, you know, some practical examples to you so that you can gather all that and then make that decision for yourself about what's going to make you the happiest when you drive your car. You know, I think that's about all I have today. So um, let's go over to the guys and see if there are any questions coming in that maybe we can assist with. No questions? Okay. Well, in that case, uh, thank you very much for hanging out today. I know this was a little disjointed, but these, these kind of questions are, there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of situational advice that would have to get baked into real specific answers. So I was doing my best to be general. And, and again, our customer service guys can try to help you if you want to get more specific with your particular application. Um, so again, if you liked our videos, uh, this one or any of the others in general, please remember to like and subscribe and keep us doing this every week. And thanks again. We will see you next time.